Well, good morning, Willow. It is good to be with you. My name is Dave, and I'm one of the pastors here, and super pumped to be with you, because we're going to talk about something today that honestly crept up on me. Like, they gave me this topic, and honestly, at first I was like, meh, and then over time, I've just kind of fallen in love with this, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Let me, let me get at it this way. At all of our locations, let me just tell you, everybody online, thank you for being here. Um, I, I was this week, I went to an event that, um, that Ron Bueno uh, was at, and, and some of you are familiar with that name. He was here for our COH, uh, and he's one of our global partners. He works with Enlace. In fact, he runs it. He's the, the I don't know, the president or the, the director or the overlord. I don't know his title, but anyway, uh, he runs that, and that is one of our partners in Central and South America, and um, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but as he was kind of, we were catching up and he was telling me about things and that sort of thing, I had this question creep up in the back of my mind. And the reason I'm embarrassed to tell you what my question was is because of why I had the question. My question was, how do you do work effectively in Central and South America with the cartel, the drug cartels being such uh, you know, a heavy and powerful influence in those communities. And the reason that I had that question is because I just watched a Netflix special on the cartel. Like, I wish it was, I'm such a, I have such knowledge of the world, but the truth is I was just into this movie. So anyway, I asked him this question and he described to me how, well, you, you know, Dave, what we did was when we came in, we first started um, caring for the poor. Uh, we started to provide food for people in a community. We started providing medicine for people in a community. If there were kids that couldn't get to school, we tried to help them with, with, um, with their education, all that. We just started serving people. And what happened over time is that the cartel, the gangs in the cartel started noticing what we were doing. And what we were doing, we were doing it to like the cartel, like a gang member's mom or to her grandmother or his little sister or whatever or their cousin or this sort of thing and so over time what began to happen is the cartel didn't just push against us but they began Dave now like over time we've sort of like they're they help us sometimes like there have been times he told me about some stories where the cartel actually provided armed security for what they were doing down in Central America. He said that when uh, Enlace rolls up, uh, he said, first of all, we don't put Enlace on anything. That's the name of their organization. He said, the reason we didn't do that in the beginning is because we wanted to, to make the local church the champion. We wanted to promote the local churches down there. He said, but eventually what would happen is the bosses of the cartel said, we want you to put enlace on your cars. We want you to put enlace on your t-shirts because we want to know who you are because if it's you, we're going to let you into parts of town that we wouldn't let other people into. He was telling me that, yeah, they roll up on these, I think, they're, I think he said they were called polstas. And, and the reason they called polstas is because these little kids, some as young as five and six years old, would stand by the light poles on the, on the streets, and these five and six-year-olds had cell phones, and when cars would come in, they would report, they would text over to the next layer up of the gang who would layer it up to somebody else, and that way they would kind of control who gets to go where in a town, and they said once they put a lasse on their cars, well, now the pollsters are letting them into parts of town that no one else could get in, and I'm like, wow, do you know why that happened? because of the kindness that they showed from the very beginning. Kindness, because of kind acts of service, of provision. The kindness that they showed, in Lasse has actually won the trust, and even in some ways, sometimes, the support of the dangerous cartel gangs. Kindness. Here's the thing. If you'd have found out yesterday, hey, um, what we're going to talk about in church tomorrow is kindness, I have a feeling that at least somebody in here would have been like, meh, maybe we'll sleep in. We'll go to Bedside Baptist this weekend, listen to Preacher Pillow a little bit. Um, because kindness is, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like, what, what are we going to talk about? Taking a friend to the airport? 
We could talk about leaving a little bigger tip than we normally would have at a restaurant. Or we could talk about letting somebody out in traffic. I mean, it's kindness. It doesn't seem like a big deal, especially when you uh, compare it to the other fruit of the Spirit we've been talking about. We've talked about love. Guys, we write songs about love. We have movies about love. We're, we're all looking for love. Joy, the fruit of the spirit of joy. Who doesn't want a deep sense of happiness in their life? That we spend all kinds of money chasing happiness. Uh, uh, I just saw that we spend $253 billion a year on alcohol. We spend $120 billion a year on illicit drugs. Do you know we spend $3,000 a second as a country on pornography? Why are we doing those things? In some ways, it is because we're constantly looking for that little bit of happiness, that little bit of dopamine hit, that little bit of joy. We're looking for these things. I mean, joy is a pop. Man, I could preach on joy and where to really find it in Jesus. Joy. What about peace? Peace? You can't watch the news today without instinctively praying for peace in the Middle East, in Ukraine. And as much as that creates um, an unsettled spirit in us, a, a sense that we wanna pray for peace in our world, the truth is, is if we, if we don't have peace in our relationships, if there's not peace in our home, goodness, we, pay, we pray with even more passion for that kind of peace. So peace, that's a big deal. That's worth a sermon. But kindness? What about self-control? The truth is, self-control as a fruit of the Spirit, man, that could change everything for some of us. What would it, what would it be like if you had perfect self-control? What, what would that do to your impulses? Perfect self-control of your impulses? Perfect self-control of your words, of your tongue? You know, the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. How many of you have ever... Just, just laid into somebody and then later regretted what you said. What if we had perfect self-control? What if I had perfect self-control over my fitness? You know, I was in, <laughs> I was in the gym a couple weeks ago and I'm on the stationary bike and I'm, I'm in like two, three miles on the stationary bike and by that time I'm sweating, I am panting, I'm feeling sorry for myself. And in comes this guy, he's a bigger dude, like he's coming in and he's got his gym bag slung over like this and he walks into the gym and my, my stationary bike is right near the entrance. And so he walks in like this and kind of gets, I mean, he's like, you know, five, six feet away from me and he's up at the counter talking because he's not gonna go in until he finishes his blizzard. Now this is my kind of guy, okay? He's like coming in finishing a blizzard. But I'm thinking to myself, you know, blizzard, at the gym, I think to myself, man, what would it be like if I could completely uh, have self-control in my life? But kindness, yeah, but see, kindness is not weak. Kindness is not this insignificant little value. K kindness is powerful enough to soften the dangerous, powerful cartel. Kindness tears down walls and builds bridges. Kindness is in some ways love expressed. The power of love expressed. You can think about a time when you were discouraged and someone's kind words lifted your spirit and, and changed the, the trajectory of your day, of your week, maybe even of your life. Some of you could point to the person at your office or the teacher at your school that showed you some kindness and therefore sort of changed the trajectory of your career or of, of your schooling or of your life. They, they gave you a leg up at the office. They gave, you, they gave you a break maybe that you hadn't quite earned because they, they believed in you. Kindness is a powerful thing. Some of you students, you, you, you might think of the, of the kind person that said, come sit with us at the lunch table because you were new at the school or new in the area, and so they invited you into their friendship group. Some of you remember uh, the teacher, or maybe, I'll tell you this, one time we were teaching on the greatest teacher uh, was Jesus, but I, I decided let's do something for teachers, and I told everybody, hey, you're gonna go out to eat anyway, 
You're gonna go out to eat for church anyway. Why don't you go and leave the biggest tip you've ever left for your server? Right? Wouldn't that be amazing? And then I said, and then when you go to school, as we start school, let's, let's write thank you notes to the school. Let's provide gift baskets for the teachers. Let's just do all these amazing things. And, and we saw over time that people just writing back to the church, people like hashtagging Instagram posts, people going, man, the, the kindness of this place is beginning to have an effect. I think kindness can even change a community. Kindness is a powerful thing. And so we talk about kindness today. So I did a search on the word, and I just kind of opened my Bible and started looking through. And do you know there's a book of the Bible that kindness and the word itself appears again and again and again and again. And then if you start to read even more of that book, you see the concept of kindness whether it's the kind words that you express or it's, it's providing for the needy or th- different things where even the concept of kindness is, is, is represented even more. And it's the book of Proverbs. King Solomon, the wisest, the richest leader to ever live. I don't know if you look up to people in your industry or you look to certain people because you think they're wise or successful. This guy was the most wealthy, the most wise person the world has ever seen. And so he writes down some of that wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And one of the things he says, Proverbs eleven seventeen, a kind man benefits himself, but a cruel man brings trouble on himself. And sure enough, you read that, Proverb and the next proverb. And I'm gonna share some of these proverbs with you along the way, but also along the way, I want, you to, I want you to understand that Solomon has this theme of kindness, and it made me ask the question, where did he learn so much about kindness? Well, Solomon is the son of King David. And I think that maybe one of the places that Solomon learned about kindness was in the household that he grew up in the household that he was a part of, because I'm gonna show you today an act of kindness by King David that just really kind of flies in the face of what's normal. 2 Samuel 9.1, it says, David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, Saul is the king who was king before David, and he hated David because God had chosen that David was gonna be the next king. And Jonathan, this is Saul's son, and he's also David's best friend, and David is recalling this promise that he made to Jonathan before Jonathan died, was killed in battle. Jonathan said to David, 1 Samuel 20, 42, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship. So these two uh, should have been enemies, Jonathan, the son of Saul, and, and, and David, the next king. Jonathan and David are friends, and Jonathan says, let's swear friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me. So there's a promise, there is, a, there is an agreement here, a covenant. Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So in other words, um, uh, what was customary in that time was that when a new king took over, they would, unfortunately, they would wipe out the descendants of the former king because they didn't want to revolt. They didn't want that king, and uh, that family to revolt and, and, and insurrection. And so it was customary that, that David would have kind of wiped out all of Jonathan's family, but this promise was made. And David is reminded of this fact, and it says in 2 Samuel 9-2, it says, now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba, and they summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And at your service, he replied. And the king asked, here it is, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? 
And Ziba answered, well, the king still has a son of Jonathan. His, he's lame in both feet. In other words, yes, there is a descendant. And I just want to, in case you're thinking that, you know, in case you're putting one over on me and you don't really want to show him kindness and you really just want to find him so you can stamp him out, let, let me, let me kind of let you know that he's, he's disabled, He's lame in both feet. He's not going to be somebody that that leads a revolt, an insurrection against you. David asks one question in verse 4. He says, where is he? The king asked Ziba, answered, he's at the house of Makar, son of Amiel, in Lo-Debar. Now, Lo means no, and Debar means pasture. So this is an area of no pasture, no grass, no no, no fertile land, this is no pasture. So in other words, uh, m- this kid is spending his time merely existing, merely th- surviving out in this wasteland. He's from the wrong side of the tracks. That's where he's hanging out. And then we learn his name. 2 Samuel 9, 6. When Mephibosheth, that's a tongue twister right there. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David He bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. You better believe that's how he replied. Don't miss what's going on here. Their family had been in a civil war for two years, the house of David, the house of Saul. David, it, this, this disabled young man is bowing in front of the king who probably is standing on a bear skin rug because he'd killed a bear in his life. He probably had a, a lion's head mounted above the fireplace behind him because he'd killed a lion in his life. This is David. He's a warrior. This is David who killed Goliath and chopped off his head. This is David the warrior, and it would have been customary for David to wipe this kid off the face of the earth. And so don't miss the terror in this moment. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land that belong to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and he said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? The Bible minces no words. It says in 11b, kind of the happy ending to this thing. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Three things I want to show you about this story. The first is that kindness often happens outside of our normal routine. Um, The normal routine for King David would not have been to be hanging out in Lodabar and not even concerned with what was happening in Lodabar. Because David is going to be hanging out in the kingdom, in the palace. He's going to be hanging out with the the privileged, with the educated, with the wealthy. He's not going to be seeking out people from Lodabar. And yet that's what he did. It it had he had to go outside of his normal routine of what would have been natural for him to be able to show the kind of kindness that God wanted him to show. Willow. We will have to go outside of our normal routine to show the kind of kindness that God is longing, is calling us to show. Some of us in the suburbs, we never, we never encounter poverty. We, or we'll drive right past it or we see it on the TV and, 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 and we just become numb to it. We, we see on the TV some commercial about some kids save the children and, and, and our heart might be pricked for a moment right until we click on to the next ESPN show that we want to see. For our friends down in Chicago, I know. I know you walk amongst 
some of that poverty. But even when, I'm reminded of when I used to work down in the city. And I gotta tell you, like the first time I was down there, I remember kind of walking past and, 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 um, and just um, uh, seeing, being shocked by some of the things that I saw. But how quickly it was that I just got used to it. Is that true for you? How quickly you begin to change your train routes or the places that you walk or the people that you hang out with so that those things even just sort of, those images just fade to the background. Folks, for some of us, we're gonna have to get outside of our routine of apathy to show the kind of kindness that God is calling us to show. For some of us, it's not apathy. For some of us, what is going to stop us is we're going to need to get outside of our routine uh, or our stewardship routine. Some of us will say, man, I would love to be kind. I would love to, to be generous with someone. I thought, we just saw that video. I'd love to do what Luke did. But you know what? I can't do that because I'm in debt up to my eyeballs or I've got so many things that I'm making payments on so that when some opportunity becomes, uh, comes, makes itself available, I don't have the margin financially to show kindness to someone. Maybe what we need to do is get out of our stewardship routine and begin to create margin so that we can share with somebody. I was in a meeting, I was at, uh, at an event and the CEO of Chick-fil-A was there and they were asking, how do you balance profits versus all of your philanthropic work? And they were asking questions about that. And one of the things he said was, without margin, there is no mission. Without margin, there is no mission. And I think about that financially. I also think about that, for some of us, it's, it's margin in our schedule. We're just so busy doing everything that you know, we think is important. We're chasing our career, we're helping our kids you know, become soccer stars, we're, we're doing everything that needs to be done, and yet, we, so we don't have time to go volunteer at the care center. Or, or at your campus, every one of our campuses has local outreach partners where we could, if we wanted to, wouldn't take more than a, a phone call to figure out how could we serve. For some of us, it's, it's, a, it's a margin problem in our routine. For some of us, we're gonna to have to get outside of our routine of stress. I'm so guilty of this. I, I'll walk up to a clerk at a gas station and I'll pay for my drink and, and I'll say, hey, how you doing? And, and they'll say, I'm okay. And I'll say, okay, thanks, see ya. Because the truth is, I got, I got stresses of myself. I got pressure, I got things. I, I need to make myself, I wanna work on being so emotionally healthy so that when God shows me a need in the world or something happens in my family or something, I wanna be able to see that. I, I wanna be able to have the emotional margin to say, tell me how you're really doing. How can I help? Folks, that's my question to you. What is the normal routine that you're gonna to have to get out of to notice, to be intentional, to create the margin, to show the kindness that God is calling you and us as a church to show the world? The uh, second thing I'd share with you is that kindness gets personal in this story. Mother Teresa said, today it's fashionable to talk about the poor, Unfortunately, it's not fashionable to talk with the poor. It's so much easier to write the check and send it on. Um, but not David. I mean, David could have sent money. You, you, you saw that he gave back the lands of Saul to Mephibosheth. And if that's all he did, we would still herald him as a hero, we would still talk about his incredible kindness. We'd be like, wow, I can't believe he gave that to that young kid, Mephibosheth. But did you see what he did? He invited Mephibosheth to the royal table into relationship with his own family. Willow, who are you sharing your life with? Who's that young person at your work that you've pulled aside and you've learned their name and you said, you know what, I just want to invest in you. I, I want to see you become everything that God created you to become. 
Who, who's the, the person that you don't just give a hand down to, but you, you give a hand up and, and you bring them alongside you and you sit at the table? That's why I love this idea of eating with people. I love the idea of having relationship with people, of actually knowing people's names that we serve because the truth is we're never reaching down to someone else. We are at the foot of the cross with them. We are on level ground with them. We are, we are saved by God. We've been given everything we have by God, so we are right there with them, just pulling with them. We are beggars who have found bread, and all we need to do is help other people find the bread of life as well. So who is it that you are getting um, personal with in your life? Proverbs 14, 21 says, it is a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. And real quick, do you know what kindness that comes out of your mouth is called? Encouragement. And it doesn't cost you a lot to give encouragement, and yet it is such a powerful thing. Proverbs 20, or 12, 25 says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. <laughs> hey, what if, what if we did that? What if God took a, a videotape of your life and just kind of reviewed it with you for last year? And he gave you a dollar for every kind, positive word you said to somebody. But he took away a dollar for every negative, gossipy, critical thing that you said about somebody. Would you be a rich person or a poor person? The power in life and death is in the tongue, Proverbs says. Kindness is gonna require us to get outside of our routine. Kindness gets personal, but kindness stems from a loving relationship. What do I mean? Well, David, in this story, we don't even know if he even knew Mephibosheth existed. We don't know if they'd ever met before this point. It's not like David looked at Mephibosheth and just, he was like, oh, I've always loved Mephibosheth. He's just one of my favorites. That, that's not really it. We don't know that they'd ever even met. But you know what? David loved Jonathan, his dad, David's best friend, Saul's son. David loved Jonathan. He loved Mephibosheth's father. And so because David loved Mephibosheth's father, David loved Mephibosheth. Second, Second Samuel 9, 7, we read it already, but look at the emphasis. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness. Why? For the sake of your father, Jonathan. We got some young staff around here, and they're getting married, and they're, they're having babies, and it's just, it's one of the joys of my life to watch these things. Uh, um, some of you know uh, at the South Barrington campus, Mario, that leads worship here, and he's married to another staff person, Katie, the, the Gonzaleses, and Katie works in our C&J ministry, and they're gonna have a baby. And they haven't even had this baby yet. But you know what? I love that baby. I love that little baby. I, I, every time I see Katie, I'm just like, ooh, are you okay? Let, you know, let's sit down. Don't carry that everything. Like, let's take care of that baby, you know? And, and Sav and Tristan, Sav works with our students in, in, in production, and Sav is gonna have a baby. And I tell you what, I just, I look at these young people every time I see them, and I'm like, oh, I just love you, and I love that baby and I haven't met your baby, and that baby hadn't done anything for me, you know, but I just love that baby because I love them. It's just, I love the baby because I love them. Can you imagine if they named one of their babies after me? <laughs> well, just think about that. I mean, I don't want to put any pressure on it, but I mean, just think about that. That would be wrong if I, you know, abused my power in such a way to us to cast that vision, but I mean, just think about how amazing that would be. Little, little, little DeVita running around, little, little Dave. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I think that's supposed to be the fuel of our kindness. We love people because we love God, and they are God's kids. They're God's babies. 
And so, like, ma'am, I, I don't know you. I don't know that we've met. I don't, I don't know you. You've never done anything for me personally that I know, but, like, I immediately, like, I want, you're God's daughter. And so I, I need to love you. I need to be ready to show kindness to you. I love you. And here's the thing, because some, there are some people, not you, it's somebody else, but not you. But there are sometimes other people, they're not nice to me. Sometimes they ignore me. Sometimes they neglect me. Sometimes they critique me. Sometimes they're mean to me. But that doesn't take away the fact that they're God's kids. And because I love him, I need to love them. Does that make sense? Mother Teresa was... Mother Teresa was motivated by this. She said, when we touch the sick and needy, we touch the suffering body of Christ. And I think that makes a lot of sense, especially based on Matthew 25. And I'm just gonna read this real quick and then we'll be done. Um, I've got these old files where I'll just I'll throw things in there and I'm not sure who embellished Matthew 25 in this way. It, it might have been Rick Warren. Um, I used to take a lot of things from him, and I, I put this in a file. But in, in chapter 25, Jesus said this, and, and I'm just gonna read this to you, and it's just embellished a little bit from Scripture, so give me the grace of that. But just understand this, uh, hear this. Jesus said that one day he will return to earth and he'll separate all the kind human beings on his right and those who failed at kindness on his left. And I will say to those on my right, come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world, because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was illiterate and you taught me how to read. I had no work, I didn't have a job, and you helped me get training. I was old and sick and alone in a nursing home, and you, you used to come and visit me, and I, and I was on the streets, and you helped me find a place to live. I was sitting in prison. I was regarded as a convict to be feared and shunned, and, and yet you used to come be with me and give me hope. And then Jesus says, I'll turn to those on my left and say, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eter eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was starving, and you knew it. But you looked the other way, and you pretended like you didn't see it. I, I was hopelessly illiterate, and you didn't lift a finger to help me learn how to read. I was without work, but all you really cared about was your career. I was alone and old and sitting in a nursing home, and you forgot I was there. I was living on the streets, but your house was on a much <laughs> nicer street. You never used to visit mine. I was in prison. Your only concern was to make sure that my prison didn't get built in your backyard. Jesus said that those on his left will be quite surprised by these words. And they will say, when did we see you like that? I don't remember that ever happening. If only I'd known it was you. Uh, when did we ever treat you like that? And Jesus will say, whatever you did for the least of these, your brothers and sisters, you did it for me. And whatever you did not do for the least of these, your brothers and your sisters, you did not do it for me. So, Willow, how are you doing with kindness? Because it's a really big deal. You ever take the opportunity to step out of your normal routine to show kindness to someone? Do you ever show kindness by getting personally involved? Do we let our relationship with Jesus be our overwhelming motivation for the kindness that we show? Now, here's the concern with a message like this, and that is that we will walk away with only the secondary application of this story in our mind. 
Because the secondary application of this story is that we need to show kindness like David showed kindness. That's the secondary application because the primary lesson is the one you don't want to miss, and that is that you and I are Mephibosheth in this story. We're Mephibosheth. David is the prototype king. He is Jesus Christ. He is he's the one who will someday welcome us into his family to sit and feast with him at his royal table. And we are Mephibosheth, crippled by our sin, paralyzed by our guilt. And as broken as we are one day, if we accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we can find ourselves princes and princesses. 